Okay, we're back here live at Dell World. Uh, day two of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, siliconangle.com. This is our TV program, The Cube. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of siliconangle.com. Join with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of wikibon.org, and we have a repeat guest, a CUBE alum, Kim Stevenson, the CIO of Intel. Uh, Kim, welcome back. Thanks. We Glad saw to be you here. Uh, this summer. We were at HP Discover. You came on, mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately, we we missed your keynote uh, because we were doing the cube. But uh, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you said, but, what's going on here. But you didn't miss it because my keynote is at two thirty. Oh, afternoon. somebody said, "Come on in and see the Intel." I, I, yeah. uh, 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 I think Intel is had, presenting. I just assumed. Right, so it was tell us yeah, what no, you're going had, to say. We had a couple. <laughs> we had a couple. I will give oh, a good. couple previews. So what are you going to talk about in your keynote? So um, <laughs> the title of my keynote is "Delivering Value in the Connected Economy," and. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be bold and posture that IT organizations, enterprise IT organizations, have to fundamentally transform the way we deliver IT um, with a focus on velocity, business velocity, creating that velocity um, for our business. And I think that between foundation of a cloud, social, big data, um, and the consumerization of IT, that enables those changes to happen. But if we don't make the changes for our organizations, I think um, the business will do it without IT. So summarize the difference. How does IT, how is IT delivered you know, today and historically, and what's got to change? So I think um, we've, historically we've built sort of from the bottoms up, and, um, and we set service level agreements and prioritizations based on what IT is capable of doing. Um, and we look at our organizational resources to do that. I think in the future, you've got to have <clears throat> that foundation of a cloud, and you're going to build from the top down. Business needs first. And you need to look at the resources available in the industry, whether you do it in-house or um, through a service provider or a software as a service. I think delivery models are really challenged in terms of delivering at speed. And so software as a service and some of the new delivery models enable you to deliver faster. Yeah, because that's always been the objective of a CIO is to go deliver business needs first, right. but, the, but the technology infrastructure just didn't allow for that, right? Yeah. Right, 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 so. So um, when we were at HP Discover, we had a great chat about what you guys are doing at Intel, obviously Intel, pioneering, eating their own dog food, whatever the expression goes, you guys were talking about big data. We like drinking our own champagne. Drinking our own champagne, <laughs> old wine, new bottle. <laughs> All that good stuff, but you guys are leading the charge. You're on the bleeding edge, the, the lunatic fringe, as we always so we sometimes say. But you know, Intel is process driven, so you don't just do these things for the sake of doing them. You guys have to really put them into practice. So one of the messages Michael Dell's saying here today is obviously transformation, building blocks. He used an example in his keynote where Tulane University had all these IT projects and the Katrina hit, and they in essence had a clean sheet of paper. So my question is, you know, the message of protecting the legacy versus protecting the future. A lot of IT professionals and CIOs and chief innovation officers have to look at, I have legacy, I wish I had a clean sheet of paper in order to re-architect. So in this time of rebuild or reconstruction or value creation, business velocity, what, what are you seeing out there, one, the landscape of dealing with the legacy and, and, and bringing in the new era, modern era, and what can CIOs do to think about that? Yeah, um, so that is a challenge. Um, I, I think there's a, you have to pick the most impactful business areas, what's really where the business is going, and those are the ones you need to really clean sheet. There's going to be a whole slew of other components of your business that you might just live for now with the legacy, and where you've decided to clean sheet, you have to take the hard decision of freezing the past and inventing the future. You can't continue to make incremental upgrades to the past or you'll never have the resources or the time to invent that future. And so that has to be a negotiation with your business unit partners that um, <clears throat> we're going to go through this freeze in order to deliver. Um, and then if you deliver with the velocity the business unit needs, generally they're, they care more about their future than the tactics of today. And so I think we speak more their language when we help architect that future. Um, what are some of the table stakes for the business velocity value creation that you're, you're referring to and you'll talk about in your keynote? Because yeah. you know there are you got to make those hardcore decisions, almost like a capital budgeting exercise around IT services. Yeah. Um, but what are, the, what are the things that you're seeing that are must-haves right now that, that are the table stakes for IT? Is it uh, fixed and storage stuff? Is it network? <laughs> Where are the areas that you're seeing that, you know, hey, that room's on fire, we got to take care of that first, or, you yeah. know, shore up so, certain areas? So, you know, 
I, probably last even last summer, but it, certainly a year ago, I would have said cloud is a trend. People should be looking at it. <clears throat> and now I say, you know, uh, it's here. Start delivering. And when I say cloud, you know, it's that full, complete, converged infrastructure. That the um, the idea that you you know have a complete environment to work from, and then start landing your applications on top, um, has. Tremendous, it reduces QA time, it reduces provisioning time, um, and that helps enable the, the business, but you have to build these converged environments to be able to do that at speed. And what are some of the things that you're seeing that customers are fumbling with and getting their arms around, or I shouldn't say fumbling, but like really critical attention on? Is it, is it uh, the app side of the equation, is it the infrastructure? I mean, because the, the same model exists, infrastructure, yeah. middleware, apps, mm -hmm. now it's okay. You know, converged infrastructure, you know, data, virtualization, yeah. layers, and then apps, yeah. which are you know, highly diverse, bring your own device, consumer edges, so you know, consumer devices at yeah. the edge. So is it the apps coming down from the top? Is it coming up from the bottom? Um, so I'd say both. And the infrastructure side, I think software-defined networks are uh, a big um, inflection point for us and a different way to manage the network. You know, manage it more like a software push versus having to send someone physically there to, um, check a configuration or change a configuration. That will have enormous benefits for us, um, but it's just emerging. It's just emerging and um, we're trying out a couple different ones, but I don't think we've got something yet that we would say we've bet Intel's entire network on just yet. That's coming, I think, in 2013. On the apps <coughs> side, I think the big challenge is the shifting of the service delivery model, shifting to software as a service when you have this legacy base of, base of monolithic applications. And so, um, as we put in an enterprise service bus, we, we've started to make that enablement available so that we can land um, software as a service applications on there and still do that back end integration, which you ultimately are going to have to do. Do those two trends go hand in glove, the software defined piece and the, the service level architecture, uh, and how, how important is it that they're they're aligned so that you can align with your, so, your business? Yeah, I, I think that most people would say they're not. I disagree with that, that the more <clears throat> you put into um, thinking about how does this business operate, the more you know you need the flexibility um, to do things from central location at the time that you need with the velocity that you need, and so more and more of that software flexibility is, is needed. And so I think they're, they're just, they're the same premise that manifests itself in different environments. So whether it's the network environment or a software, you know, enterprise application environment. And does that concept of software defined networking, does it, does it need to extend into, well it's, I guess it's in servers already with virtualization, but it, does sure. it need to extend into, for example, the, the storage layer? And do those three, you know, we talk about convergence, do those three pieces have to sort of come together as software defined to really enable that vision mm -hmm. that you're putting Yeah, through. and you've seen, um, you know, storage pools before, whether it's a SAN environment. Um, <clears throat> today we're, we're getting a lot of great um, benefits out of SSDs moving into the data center. So, you know, we've had them on the PC for a few years mm -hmm. um, and we're getting a lot of performance benefits, but now taking that, um, that flash environment and uh, making it a big storage resource pool, you need the management layer to go along with that. So I think that's evolving quite nicely and we're seeing benefit. Um, <clears throat> and I think that'll continue to evolve to also. So you guys are taking advantage obviously of, of Flash, you just mentioned that. Do you see mm -hmm. sort of all your active data at some point being serviced out of Flash? I don't know yet, I don't know yet. Um, so uh, certainly a large percentage of it. Um, our data, I think a lot of companies experience this, but our data is growing, you know, in excess of 30% every year. Um, and all different size in my manufacturing, in my design environment, in my sales and marketing environment, all of it's growing. Mm -hmm. um, we can afford to keep it with, with things like Flash, um, which makes it easy to use. We're putting in some Hadoop clusters to uh, take our unstructured data and make that usable. Uh, that's that's proving to be you know a good way to keep data for us. So, um, so I, guess, I don't know. So I guess what I'm yeah. what I what I, <laughs> yeah. what, I'm, what I really want to get to is for the last ten years, it's about it's been about doing more. I mean, ever since Nick Carp produced Does IT Matter, 
right? Yeah, it's yeah. About doing more with less, cutting cost, IT spend as a percentage of revenue has come yeah. down. Obviously, the industry's continued to do well, but um, the, 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 the perception of IT as an investment vehicle uh, mm -hmm. to drive business value, really drive business value and productivity and revenue generation hasn't really been the main focus in the last 10 years. Do right, you see that with changing that. With, with big data analytics and big data insights and, and, and new architectures like Flash that can totally change the application development yeah. paradigm? Yeah, so I think the last decade's been about IT productivity, mm -hmm. data center consolidation, apps rationalization, virtualization, et cetera, and we've done a great job as a profession to get um, that IT efficiency done. The next decade is about business productivity. We get the most profitable, every dollar of revenue is the most profitable it can be. You're getting the most revenue you can get. And IT will enable that. And I mean IT information technology. W the organization that provides that I think may change over time. Whether it's your internal IT organization or a um, external organization that provides that capability. Or, or well, the, the other thing is that you're seeing with, especially in big the big data world, the, the meme is about CMOs going to have more money than CIOs to yeah. spend. So some, some of this stuff's going to be difficult to count. You know? I, I think it is going to be difficult yeah. to count. Um, uh, so I th And I th think that's another indication that what's really important is the business getting productive with what the business yeah, right. needs to do. And, mm -hmm. and Realistically, what business operation can you think of today that can run without information technology? Kim, a uh, question I have I'll for think you. about that. I'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so obviously, IT is transforming. When you mentioned services and services delivery, mm -hmm. um, obviously the services business is changing from the classic service yeah. providers, the consultants, the big the big houses outsourcing. So IT services has been on this outsourcing trend for many dec for a decade and. Now they got to retrench and provide more, invent the future as you say, but also IT as a service is mm -hmm. critical. Can you talk about what's changing in those areas, personnel wise, um, in terms of the, 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 the players, the participants, both inside IT and outside delivering services, mm -hmm. and the kinds of IT services that we will see in the next you know, five to 10 years? Yeah, yeah, so, um, so skills are a big, um, a big deal. Always have been for IT, but again, I believe we're at this inflection point and <clears throat> there are skills that we need that are very, very scarce today. So in, in data, that's the data scientist, um, in BI architects, that not reporting architects, but visualization and predictive modeling, machine learning, those types of things. It's a combination of statisticians, computer scientists, and business rules, people that really understand the business rules. So today we solve that problem with several people, you know, generally four or five people. Tomorrow, I think what you're going to see is a maturing and a blending of that real data scientist. Uh, and, and that, I would tell you, that would be a very good investment for every enterprise IT organization to make, is find that career path that throws people into becoming data scientists. So the business productivity you mentioned as the focus, that data scientist doesn't have to be some PhD math jock or you know some geek who's programming math and doing on machine learning. It's also the business analyst, right? So right. if IT's evolving in that direction, what does that role look like? Is it uh, someone with an MBA? <laughs> Is it just someone multidisciplinary? What are you seeing that skill set as? Yeah, I think it's um, primarily the business process. So whatever the business process, so you might be from manufacturing, you might be from sales, from you know engineering, but understanding you know the process that you're trying to execute is going to be really important because then they can apply you know that ideal state and help the computer scientist to you know program the environment but the without the the most important is to really understand the business process that you're trying to execute right the, the other the other public we'll secret out. that's out there is that you know there's been a big disruption in the delivery on the outsourcing side of the big firms like the yeah. cap gemini's and the essentials have made a nice little you know, franchise building these from ERP, CRMs, the old days of client server, establish these massive practices. So what do you see changing on the landscape side of the, the new school delivery of, and IT always goes outside for help, whether it's mm -hmm. cloud, sure. big data, there's always yeah. consultancies out there. What are you seeing out there for these new school firms that, that, that are successful? What are the characteristics of these new, new, new added value um, service providers? Well, um, so I think there's, there's sort of commercial terms significant differences and then there's the technology differences. On the commercial terms, you know, the traditional agreements were three, five, seven, ten year contracts. And and I saw a lot of them, right? They're 
two, four, six hundred pages long with lots of limits of liability. And um, the new commercial terms are maybe oversimplified. A credit card. Give me a credit card and you'll run. Come in when you need, leave when you need. Three sheet Very, SLA. Yeah, three sheet SLA, this is what we're going to do. Boom, you know, no limits of liability in some cases. So the commercial terms are fundamentally different. The and that's driven by what forces? Just market forces, cloud, um, technology? So that, it's a technology force. Because the, the technology, the idea that you can create these um, rich resource pools that can be dynamically reassigned, allows you to create more flexible commercial terms. And so that's effectively what's happened in the cloud providers, that they have these rich resource pools, and many people can come in, and you can stay, you know, it's like a hotel. Stay as long as you like, you know, pay me for when you stay, and when you leave, I'll bring somebody else in. There's enough demand that allows them to match the supply-demand problem, I guess, supply-demand. Um, <clears throat> and in the traditional service delivery models, when we've gone out for us, it was my mess for less, right? Take my mess, you run it, and you run it, you make it more efficient. Um, and I just think that model is seen its better days. Seen its, that's, that's a polite <laughs> way of saying it. <laughs> heading for a cliff in 19 <laughs> days. with the Another cliff. cliff. <laughs> Another cliff we're seeing. Can we talk about security a little bit? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it's a topic that's been on CIO's minds a lot. It seems like increasingly it's on the minds of CEOs, which means it's going to yeah. be more on CIO's minds. Um, at, at the end of every year, I look back and say, okay, are we more secure or less secure? And I, I, I can't remember a year where I've said, oh, I feel more secure this year. It's just. That's yeah. the way the world is. Um, President Clinton said it, that the, uh, the barriers that we put up seem more like nets than walls these days. And, mm -hmm. and it seems like the, the holes in those nets get larger and larger, or at least you know, more fragile. So I wanted to get your take on security. Um, where are we going with this thing? Is it the case that the business value of the, uh, out, outweigh the risks? Uh, and so we just have to keep charging forward? You know, can technology, help solve the problem that technology got us into? What's your angle on this? So, <clears throat> um, I, I agree with you that in our attacks are getting more and more sophisticated um, and more pervasive. Uh, so the amount that we deflect every year grows 20, 25% in terms of malicious code that's out there. The amount of malicious code that's embedded into apps that we download is, is shocking. Um, so, so what do you do? You know, in our view is we've taken what was the walled garden approach, you know, keep the bad guys out, let the good guys in, and we're now moving to this protect the data. And we protect the data uh, um, at rest, in transit, in process, um, the whole way. Uh, and I think that's the only way you can fight that. So you have to, you can't tell good guys from bad guys, so don't try to keep anybody out just protect your data and make sure your data at every state is protected. So that's the path we're heading, heading down. We've created a number of trust zones, so I trust um, that device and the user more if they're inside an Intel facility than if they're on VPN, or if they're in um, a country, you know, some countries are um, less trust worthy from a, a cybersecurity perspective. So when you're in that country, we don't give you access to certain applications. And so, you know, we granularize our trust model based on the data that you're trying to access and what you're trying to do. Um, and that, I think, is probably the right approach. It's hard to do, it's hard to do, so we complement that with some advanced BI security um, that, you know, uh, with processing power today, I can, you know, get billions of um, events codified and isolated in a very short amount of time. And I th so I think you need both. So a lot of the big problems in this industry are solved, you know, obviously most of the big problems are solved, you know, not by one company, but uh, you know, an yes. ecosystem. But frequently that ecosystem is, is led by one company. It might be Intel, I know you guys are working on the speed of light problem, you know, if we could solve that. But <laughs> You know what I mean? There's usually, you know, you're a, a leader and you build an ecosystem around it and you lead that charge. How do you think the security problem gets solved? Is it more of a, you know, a, a, a level playing field in terms of the leadership or can, an, can a company like Intel actually lead to solve that problem? Or is it just too big? Um, so I think it will take a whole ecosystem mm -hmm. and um, the Intel model and approach has been to enable and enable in the e entire ecosystem. We're taking some of the security <coughs> from our, we acquired McAfee, um, you know, coming up on two years yep. now. Um, 
and we're taking some of their code and putting it down, yep. you know, into the firmware, so at below the root kit to pry, but that's one layer, you still have to protect your data. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the ecosystem comes in. So we're sponsoring um, hackathons and we're sponsoring secure code practices and that's eco industry enabling, right? Okay, Kim, we're getting the hook here, but I want to ask you <laughs> one last question to leave, leave off the uh, interview. For the folks out there watching, we're here at Dell World 2012. This is their second um, Dell World event. I mean, they used to go to you know, the, the consumer shows and they had the PCs. Michael Dell's still you know, so proud. He's pushing the clients, he's behind it, which is great. Um, share with the folks out there what's happening at Dell World. What is the Dell transformation about? And what does it mean for the enterprise IT pro or CIO? What is, Share with the folks what you're extracting out of the, the signal here from, from Dell World. What is Dell all about right now? Yeah, you know, um, so Dell's expanded as a company. Their portfolio's expanded. When you just walk around the floor here, you see industry orientation, healthcare, education, government. Um, and I think that that's a big move for Dell, that they, they have uh, industry specialization that um, as a CIO, you really do purchase based on what's relevant for the business you're in and the industry does matter. And so I, and I think that they've done a great job here showing some of that. Yeah. I think their open message is still great. I mean, they have violin servers up there in their main rack, which is not a Dell, Dell product. They're showing off whatever kind of building blocks <laughs> will work for the customer. I think mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a fresh approach and, and yep. a little bit unique. Yep. Okay, Kim Stevenson, the CIO of Intel, back on theCUBE, CUBE alumni, tech athlete, as we say here uh, in our, we, our, our tech center, sports center, ESPN of tech, as we like to say. Uh, thanks for coming on theCUBE, thanks for your time. I know you're super busy. And, Thank you. And uh, thanks for taking the time. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.